Hello everyone, this is Ilan Jerno here at the Ayn Rand Institute. I'm joined by my colleague Steve Simpson Hi. and Ankar Gathe. Hi. We're here to talk about a case that's before the Supreme Court that was argued recently and I think uh, a lot of people have heard about it by its colloquial name, the Gay Wedding Cake Case. Mm -hmm. uh, I actually heard about it uh, when I was asked a question at a high school when I was giving a talk and that's what the, the kids uh, really wanted to know about. And I think there's a lot of things uh, going on in this case. Uh, so why don't we start with you, Steve? Give us sort of the legal arguments and what, what's been said and what's been done. Yeah, so um, let me give you the basic facts of the case and then, we'll, and then we'll segue into that. So the case is called Masterpiece Cake Shop versus Colorado Civil Rights Commission. Um, and uh, essentially what happened is in 2012, a gay couple went into this cake shop. This is a, a cake shop in, uh, in Colorado that's uh, run by a guy named uh, Jack Phillips. And he's a Christian uh, and he takes his religion very seriously. And, and this gay couple basically asked him to make a wedding cake for their, it was actually their reception, not their wedding. The reason being that at this time, mm. uh, gay marriage wasn't legal in Colorado, but it wasn't Massachusetts. So they had gotten married in Massachusetts, and they wanted to have their reception in uh, in Colorado. Because he's a Christian, he didn't want to make a cake for them. Um, and he, by all accounts, as far as I can tell from the facts, the guy is serious. This isn't just a made up, you know, excuse not to bake a cake for for gay for gay people. He takes his religion seriously. He incorporates it into his work. Uh, as a, for instance, you know, he, he won't make Halloween cakes because he claims that that's against his religion. Uh, he doesn't work on Sundays. There are a lot of other things that he doesn't do. And, uh, and by all accounts, as I said, it seems like he's really serious about this. Um, so he said, essentially, uh, I'll sell you other things, but I'm not going to make a cake for you guys. Because that would, in, in his view, and, and this is kind of my words, sanction a ceremony uh, or an uh, uh, activity that, that he objected to on religious grounds. They sued him, basically. They filed a complaint with the Colorado uh, Civil Rights Commission, which is, the, is Colorado's uh, government entity that enforces its employment discrimination and its general discrimination laws. Now, under those laws, just to, to kind of summarize it quickly, um, uh, what they basically do is they ban any public, what's known as a public accommodation, which includes businesses, uh, from discriminating against people on the basis of a number of categories, race, sexual orientation, sex, uh, religion, ethnicity, creed, and I think national origin. And so they brought a complaint against him. The Civil Rights Commission essentially found against uh, the bakery and said that under these laws you have to uh, sell them a wedding cake. He appealed to the Colorado courts. The Colorado courts affirmed the decision of the Civil Rights Commission and held again in favor of the... Uh, of the gay couple, so he appealed from there to the U.S. Supreme Court. The case was argued on December 5th. Uh, arguments were actually fascinating. Um, there's all kinds of, you know, really interesting things to talk about, which we'll, we'll talk about. Among them, what is this case really all about? And, and uh, that is one of the big issues here. Um, a lot of people call it a free speech case. Is it, uh, is it a restriction on his free speech? Is it compelling him to, to speak when he doesn't want to speak? Uh, is it a free exercise case, a religious liberties case? Uh, is it some other kind of case? Uh, now we'll get into the discussion um, and, uh, and I can summarize the legal arguments. Um, but, uh, but one of the things I think we want to discuss is, uh, or, or examine, and the way I would put it is frankly, it's a First Amendment case. Mm -hmm. and, and, and that's an important thing to, it's an important distinction to make or an important issue to look at. That is, we have a tendency in uh, modern times for a lot of reasons to parcel out the First Amendment into, into its constituent parts, it so, makes sense to step back and look at the whole thing. But sorry, go yeah, ahead. Yeah, I was going to say, so let's break that apart for us. Yeah, so when sure. you say it's a, it's a whole First Amendment yeah. case, so what are the aspects that you see huh? uh, involved here? And then, and then I want to take a step back again and say, what's, what's at stake? What's yeah. most significant to you? So, so the First Amendment protects a number of rights, all of which are related. And if you look at the, the wording of the First Amendment, it protects... Uh, against state established religion. It protects people's freedom to exercise their religion. It protects freedom of speech and freedom of the press. It protects freedom of assembly and freedom to petition your government. And we can talk about how those are all related, but they are all related and intentionally so. The founders mm -hmm. saw all of these rights as related as a sort of constellation of rights, all of which go to, I would describe it as intellectual freedom. Mm -hmm. um, freedom to think, you know, freedom to express yourself. 
um, for a lot of reasons, these are taken as separate rights. And I mean, that, that there is some, there's a lot of sense to that, uh, oftentimes in, in particular legal disputes. But part of the problem is we tend to parcel these out and consider them all distinct rights. And there are a lot of reasons for that, again, for, uh, based on the development of American law, which we can talk about. Uh, but, but that's problematic if we, if we and, and we here, you know, at uh, ARI, think of intellectual freedom as, 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 a, as a right in and of itself that has certain kinds of implications. Um, but just to, now, how that plays out in the mm -hmm. case, if you want, I can sure. talk a little bit about that, and we'll, we'll get into this more. But the basic arguments that uh, Phillips is making, uh, he's making two arguments, basically. He's saying, making me, requiring me to bake a cake, which he takes as an expressive acti activity, he calls himself an artist, um, you can debate the nuances of the term artist. I think he's serious about that, but we can talk about that. That is, he's, he's actually putting, you know, there are artistic creative elements that go into the making of a cake. I don't think that's just made up, although, as, as I said, we can discuss the, the limits of that idea. Um, but he thinks of himself as an artist, and he looks at uh, having to bake a cake for a ceremony to which he has a moral objection to essentially amount to compelled speech. He's being compelled to speak out in a way that he wouldn't speak out. And again, we can analyze that, but that's one of his arguments. His second argument is, as a Christian, he's being compelled essentially to sanction uh, a, a practice, gay marriage, that he has a moral objection to, and that that constitutes a restriction on the free exercise of his religion, i.e. his Christianity. On the other side, the argument is uh, twofold. One, this is conduct and not speech. Um, and two, this is a law of general application that uh, we cannot make exemptions from this law on the basis of um, religion. Now, one in easy way to understand that second part, and I'll, I'll say a little bit about the first two, obviously the freedom of religion doesn't exempt you from the laws against murder, right? So you can't go out and commit murder uh, because your religion says human sacrifice is a good thing. Uh, that's off the table. And, there, and that's true, and it's good, and we, we agree with that. Um, but then the question becomes, okay, when do you have a law that is specifically restricting religion as opposed to a law of general application that has to apply to, to anybody in society as such? So that's one of the questions. On the compelled speech argument, the, the, uh, the, the, the respondents, that is the gay couple and the Civil Rights Commission, their argument is this doesn't involve speech really at all. That, yeah, he's baking a cake, but... First of all, that's just not speech. Second of all, even if it is speech, even if there's an element of speech involved, the speech is not the baker's speech, it's the gay couple's speech. They're the one who's asking him, essentially the way you would ask a sign maker, make a sign for me to advertise my business, that's really my speech, it's not your speech. You're just the, you know, you're just the person doing the lettering. That's their argument. Um, uh, and uh, yeah, so I mean, that's the essential, you know, how the, how the, the parties have squared off uh, so why don't I pause there and, and yeah. you know, we can start analyzing. Sure. Yeah. I want to bring you in, Alcar. So there's a lot going on in this case. So how would you isolate what to you is really salient and important uh, philosophically? Well, I would, let's start with the aspect that I think is least discussed. So there's a lot, there's been a lot of discussion of this as a free exercise mm -hmm. case and as freedom of speech and is it compelled speech. There's been comparatively little discussion, I think, of the issue of freedom of association or, and, and that he doesn't want to participate and be kind of conscripted into a ceremony that he doesn't want to be a part of. And you could have that kind of objection even if you didn't think that what they're making me do is speech. So even if you didn't think of the cake as it's, it's, it's a form of expressive conduct or something, it's somehow essentially um, involving speech. You could still say, I don't want to participate in that ceremony, even if it, so there, there was questions in the oral arguments about what happens if you're a caterer and just providing the food? What happens if you're doing the flower bouquet? And you could view the flower bouquets as not speech, but still think, I don't want to give my services to a kind of event that I don't want to participate in. And that's an issue about freedom of association. And it's really important to be able to have the freedom to say, I will participate in something because I agree with it, I think there's something right about it, or there's something really wrong about it and I don't want to participate. 
in it. And th that's a really important freedom that I think is being underplayed here in the discussion. And you could, um, you brought up, Steve, you brought up the issue of signs. Mm -hmm. And there is a point to saying if someone comes in and says, look, I want to make this kind of sign, can you help me? The speech is essentially the person who's going to go around yeah. carrying the placard. Mm -hmm. But nevertheless, you've participated. You've helped him engage in that kind of speech. And if you find it really abhorrent, you should be able to say, look, I don't want to be a participant in this. And the government shouldn't be conscript conscripting me into somehow being a participant in that speech, even if it's the other person's speech. So you raised this issue of being, as you put it, conscripted into something you really oppose. And you mentioned earlier in the, the summary that there's an issue of sanction here, mm -hmm. that you shouldn't be compelled to take actions or say things that you think are against your ideas. Right. So connect that with intellectual freedom, because I think you mentioned that as sort of a broad umbrella perspective mm -hmm. on this. Yeah, so um, I mean, as Ankar pointed out, the. The, our view in any event of, of intellectual freedom is that it has to involve not only what you're allowed to say and what you do say and what you actually convey um, clearly about your, your views, mm -hmm. but it has to involve freedom of action too. That it, it's ultimately that, you know, if you think of human beings, aren't we're not just floating minds, you know, or floating, you know, uh, ideas that that uh, express ourselves and we're not just you know by the same token we're not just you know soulless robots we're integrated beings and and real freedom means the freedom to think and then the freedom to take action on the basis of your 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 thoughts and your ideas I often put this as if you don't have freedom of action how does freedom of speech really make a lot of sense it's a it's a it's a it's such a limited right that it, that is you have the supposedly under the first amendment we have the freedom to think for ourselves and we have the freedom to speak but for some reason we're not supposed to be allowed to act on our on our ideas that doesn't make a lot of sense um, if I want to talk to another person, I want to persuade another person to do things, not, as, not just to hold views in their heads, but to actually take actions on the basis of those. Now, part of what government is all about is, is defining and the proper role of laws to define what actions are proper versus improper. Um, so it's not to say that you're allowed to do anything just because you can think of it, right? If I think of murder, that doesn't mean I can, I can, I can commit murder. But real intellectual freedom has to involve both the freedom to think on your own and the freedom to take actions on the basis of that. That is not how it's viewed today. Um, uh, and that's a real problem. And it's part of the reason that we get, uh, you know, I would look at this case as uh, it's a clash between the anti-discrimination laws mm -hmm. and the implications of the anti-discrimination laws. And you might even broaden it as uh, restriction on um, uh, we could put it as economic freedom or freedom of action in many contexts that the government shouldn't restrict us on, uh, on the one hand, and then an effort to leave an element or a, a space of intellectual freedom still free. And there's always been this tension in American, well not always, but certainly in the 20th century there's been this tension between uh, the effort to regulate what we do but somehow allow our uh, our political thinking and our, our our ideas to remain free. This is a case that really shows the tension there. Mm -hmm. um, so let me just end, and I'd like to hear more from Ankar on this. Uh, bottom line is, if you don't have the freedom to decide with whom you are going to deal, mm -hmm. you really don't have intellectual freedom because your your actions in dealing with other people, your support for them your sanction of their view or, or your withdrawal of sanction is very important to your ability to remain, you know, an honest individual with integrity who really takes his ideas seriously. Taking your ideas seriously means not just holding them in your head, but actually acting on those ideas. So if you don't have the right to take action on the basis of your ideas or to withhold action mm. on the basis of your ideas, you don't have real intellectual freedom. And that's the contradiction at the heart of this case. Right. Um, but but go ahead. Yeah, and notice in the First Amendment, it's so it's about freedom of speech, which is a speech is a particular type of action. But if you think of it of the other clauses and and more widely, it's the free exercise yeah. of religion, yeah. and that's bringing in all kinds of actions yeah. that you have to be able to take broader than just talking about your right. religion, and freedom of assembly. Assembly is an action. You're doing something, and it might involve speech again, so, but it's much broader. So the First Amendment, if you look at it as a whole, is protecting speech and other forms of action. Yeah. You have to take that really seriously. And then if you just think colloquially, the kind of 
um, phrase, actions speak louder than words. Mm. There is a real meaning to yeah. that. So if a person professes that, look, I'm an anti-racist, uh, I think we should have a colorblind society, judge people just by the color of their skin. So, and then every Friday he plays poker with um, racists, whether it's white supremacists or not. And they might just never be talking about racial issues and they're just playing poker and so But if this is, if this is who you're associating with, and it doesn't bother you and so that conveys and people rightly think you don't take your anti-racism the stuff you spout you do not take it seriously you do not actually believe it because it doesn't have any impact on your actions so there's a it's much broader so the court seems to and you could speak more about this have ca carved out some kind of expressive conduct to get that, mm. that you can be expressing things not directly right. through speech but it's a much wider phenomenon that you don't have to try to push into the right. free speech clause that action conveys what you think yeah. and it conveys your stance on things. And a person who thinks like morally I don't want to be involved in that has to be able to do that yeah. or you're taking his moral sovereignty away from it. Yeah. So just Sorry, just no, to jump ahead. in here. So, so my perspective on the baker is I'm conflicted because I think of him as I, I admire the fact that he takes his belief seriously enough to say, I'm not going to take these kinds of actions, I'm not going to engage with these sorts of people. Though I disagree with his beliefs completely. I mean, I, I, I wouldn't want to shop in his business, I, I wouldn't want to engage with him. I would, I would have the same perspective toward him that he has toward the gay couple. So then I'm taking from your point that there's, there's, it's super important that there be that room in society for people to be able to take those kinds of actions, whether you agree with their, their perspective on the concrete mm -hmm. issue in dispute. Um, so, uh, go ahead. And notice what has happened in his case. Now, it's in significant part, I think, because this is a big case. It's going to the Supreme Court. It's in all the newspapers. But he's lost, I think he says he's lost 40% of his business or something like that. Because people, when they realize, oh, you really won't bake a cake for a gay wedding, and so, that, well, I'm going to go shop elsewhere. I'm going to, to find other people. And in effect, we're going to... So it's again, but notice it's about freedom of association. We're not going to associate with you. This is how you're conducting your business. We're taking our business elsewhere. Um, and I think it's right for people yeah. to do that. Um, I, um, so I, because I share your view that it's, I think he should, he, he seems sincere, mm -hmm. but there's a whole element in religion where I think the whole thing um, yeah. is because you're taking it on faith, not for real reasons that there's not a sincerity yeah. there. But that's so your point though, and just to emphasize this, because I think it bears emphasis um, in, in, in understanding, in separating the, the issue in the case, the principle that's being decided here from what we think of the actions of the individuals. Mm -hmm. the, the, the principle is vitally important. Even if you think, as, as I think all three of us agree that, yeah, I don't want to deal with this guy, and it's stupid that he's not baking the cake. There is an element, it's just, this is pure stupidity, and, and I mean, it's a serious issue there, but there are, other there are other circumstances in which the issues are way more serious than something like this. It's hard to take this guy seriously, um, uh, but, uh, but, but there's a real issue here of restricting people from um, uh, from from withdrawing their sanction from activities that they really find immoral, and there's definite meaning there. And the, so uh, uh, this is one example of the fact that people want to want to withdraw their uh, support for this uh, bakery. But think of a much more you know pressing and important example. This happened during the civil rights era. This is what the civil rights protesters did. I mean, there are examples of the boycotts. That was an example of withdrawing our sanction mm -hmm. and our money mm -hmm. from businesses. But it wasn't just we're going to put you out of business by, um, by, by refusing to patronize your businesses. It was we are sending a message here mm -hmm. that it is, it is bad to, to consort with businesses that support segregation. And there were lots of fights among the black population in the South mm -hmm. but, uh, between the civil rights leaders and a lot of the, the, the people uh, the, the, the black people who were being, you know, discriminated against. But nonetheless, they wanted to shop at different businesses because they needed to, uh, you know, they obviously needed to buy food and, and, and carry on their lives. And there's a real debate about, well, what is the meaning of what you're doing here? You are sanctioning something that is really evil. I mean, we've all heard the, 
the uh, I can't remember who coined this phrase. Ayn Rand has said things like this: that that uh, the only way evil evil men can prevail is if good men remain silent. And and I would add to that: and if good people deal with mm -hmm. evil people, if they give their moral sanction, that was something that Ayn Rand talked about uh, constantly: that that evil can survive only if it has the moral sanction of the good. The only way, or one of the ways, that you withdraw the moral sanction uh, from evil is by refusing to deal with it. Um, and, uh, and people have to have the freedom to make those choices in a free society on their, on their own. So I want to pick up on that, because earlier you, you characterized the case as having a conflict between intellectual freedom and the anti-discrimination laws, specifically in Colorado, but yeah. they're a wider phenomenon. So, and, and you just, you brought up the context of the civil rights mm -hmm. movement. So, say a bit about the, the anti-discrimination laws and how you evaluate them. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so, I mean, there's, there's a lot of ironies in this case. And frankly, everything that either side has argued in terms of the, the sort of reductio arguments, if we do this, then we have to do this. Uh, those arguments cut in both directions. So, so, sorry, just to back up yeah. a bit. So, so I heard the oral arguments. I don't think everyone oh, who's, yeah, right. who's watching has heard of. So, just give a flavor of what kind of things were brought up as the reductio yeah. absurdum. Of so, this. I mean, on the the I mean the 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 overriding concern I think of both factions on the court, the the right and the left, is uh, on the on the left. It's how could you possibly protect the the religious freedom of this guy without running right up against the civil rights laws? Mm -hmm. Which uh, what we're talking about the, is is the the 1964 Civil Rights Act, which uh, it bans segregation. That's a good thing. It also uh, impeded and restricted private behavior, and and of course evil private behavior, mm -hmm. but ultimately private behavior that and I will say again, ultimately has to be free in a free society. But we should talk more about that. But it is nonetheless a concern that one would say, look, if we allow this to happen, aren't we just going to land right back in the Jim Crow era where people can discriminate as they see fit against black people for all kinds of horrible reasons and we're right back to segregation. Um, but that's the really, that's that's sort of the overriding concern is what what are the implications of either side's argument? And on the other side, it's, well, if we're not going to allow people to uh, refuse to deal with or give their sanction uh, to, let's say, gay couples if they're religious, how do we have such a thing as religious freedom? And then you can play that out. How do we have any kind of real intellectual and personal freedom? You can change the facts of the case. The one hypothetical that we were batting around yesterday, and I'll just toss it out there now. Whatever you think about gay marriage, let's push aside and, and make this a case that should be pretty easy for people to understand why it would be horrible to, to require a business owner to consort with people um, that they that really find morally objectionable. The one I came up with is imagine, uh, you know, a sign maker. And I mean, you can take all kinds of different types of people who would come in and ask him to make signs from white supremacists who say, I want signs with swastikas on them. Maybe that's you know, the one answer that actually came up, I think, during the oral mm -hmm. argument, one of the responses was, well, that's not a protected class, which, I mean, that raises all the kinds KKK. of... Yeah, the KKK. Mm -hmm. uh, but let's take one that's a little bit more sympathetic and fits into these laws. Let's say it's a group of Muslims, and they want a sign maker to make anti-Jewish signs. And there's a real good argument that that is part of their creed or their religion. Um, and certainly creed. Creed is a little bit broader than religion. It's, it's your belief system. And so one could easily say, as a Muslim, I believe that, that you know, Jews are evil. And this is, so I want you to make me a sign that says Jews are evil. And the sign maker, whether he's Jewish or not, just says, to hell with that. I don't want, mm -hmm. I don't want to make you a sign. I'm not going to make that sign. And then further, I don't even want to sell you a can of spray paint. Get the hell out of my store. I don't want to deal with you at all. I think that's absolutely appropriate. I think that's good, right? So that's an example of the the you know refusing to sanction somebody in a way that I think is absolutely appropriate and good. Um, and yet, if we play out the logic of the anti-discrimination laws, we ought to get to a point where we're saying, no, you're not allowed to do that either. Or at the very least, we have to recognize that there's a clash between saying you can't discriminate against somebody based on their creed or their religion, or one could say their national origin in this case, uh, on the one hand, and then somehow maintaining intellectual and personal freedom and the freedom not to support those that you really, and in a legitimate, objective sense, 
think are evil. So just to fl just to flesh in a bit context, so you s you get the example of the the white supremacist and the mm -hmm. swastika and, and the KKK was not a protected class. What are some of the protected classes <laughs> that are covered? Because yeah. I mean, the, you know, the Civil Rights Act yep. was about um, the treatment of blacks, yeah. and, but but it's different. Yeah. It's broader now, right? Yeah, I mean, it started with race. Uh, from there, it went to sex. So it was basically, you know, no sexual, no discrimination against women. Let's say, um, that was the big issue. Uh, yeah, so the gender, I mean, yeah, the gender, right, it, gender. Yeah. Uh, and then uh, national or, or ethnicity was probably the next one, which I mean, we could talk about if we wanted to. But ethnicity is a kind of mix of what national origin and race, race and creed. It's culture, kind of a weird yeah, yeah. mongrel yeah. concept, mm -hmm. but it covers uh, a number of things. And then from there, I think the next one was probably uh, religion. Uh, and then, you know, more recently in today's world, we have sexual orientation. Um, those are, that's the, I think that's the entire list. I can't think of anything else that fits in there. Um, oh, well, did I say national origin? Yeah. So that's a, a fairly recent one as well. Um, and of course, I mean, that's a big issue, you know, given the immigration debates and, and uh, every one of these categories um, ends up, uh, you know, ends up creating some sort of a clash among various factions or groups or people in society. Uh, and, it, and once you get to the point where, you know, you have this list, or maybe put it this way, once you start down this, this, uh, this road of creating so-called protected classes, it's really logically endless. You could come up with any, I mean, if you look at the debates about multiculturalism, intersectionality, it's endless. It's, endle it's an endless combination, combination or constellation of factors that one could uh, find to, to say, I am now a protected class. Disability, I'm sorry, I forgot disability, that's another one. Although it's really a different class of laws, but mm -hmm. I mean, they, they, they operate in exactly the same way. Um, I mean, you could do you could do intelligence. You could do all kinds of things. That and the more we get into debates about inequality, the more you can see these categories expanding. Um, and uh, and so I mean, you know, those are the classes. But my my ultimate concern with this, or there's a lot of concerns with it, uh, but one of them is this: these are just going to continue to continue to keep expanding. Um, and uh, and that necessarily has to restrict people's freedom of, of thought and their freedom of action. So just to bring you back to this, Omkar, so in the oral arguments that I heard, um, one of the things that one of the justices brought up is, well, we don't want to legislate morality. Uh, but in, in listening to the, the kind of the range of groups that are protected or classes that are protected, it seems like that, that is, the, I mean, it's a baked in moral perspective. Yeah, I mean, I think the anti-discrimination laws are explicitly an attempt to legislate morality, or at least to say um, that there's certain things that are so immoral mm -hmm. that nobody should be able to do them for whatever reason that they think that would be proper mm -hmm. conduct. So it's racial prejudice, just so evil that we're going to legislate it, that it's illegal to engage in this. And then it gets expanded to uh, religious prejudice. And, so, and there's in the oral arguments, there was the reductio was always towards race. That well, if you wouldn't bake a cake for a gay wedding, what about an interracial wedding? That and there's obviously in the case of the United States, race has a distinctive because of the history of slavery and the aftermath, and uh, and the really pathetic aftermath after the Civil War of not giving full rights and recognizing the full citizenship of blacks. Um, it has a special status in that regard. But also, there's an issue of when it's about, when you bring in something like creed, you're bringing in other people's ideas and beliefs. Mm -hmm. And now you're not even allowed to make judgments. And discri what discrimination means, you're making a judgment of it's true or false, right or wrong, good or bad. But d d people think of discrimination as always bad. Mm -hmm. It has a connotation of it's, oh, you're discriminating. But to discriminate just means to judge. And if you talk about someone, he, he's a discriminating cook, he's very good at judging what his flavors go together and what doesn't. Um, and Steve brought up the case that well, what happens if you've got the white supremacists in and you want to discriminate, and you want to discriminate against their viewpoint. 
oh, so they're not a protected class, so you can do that. But in the oral arguments, it became, well, what happens if it's a religious group who has basically yeah. the beliefs of the KKK? Now they're protected. Now is it discrimin does anti-discrimination mean you can't discriminate against them? And take that, the, it's an, the case you brought up, or the hypothetical was about signs and speech. But think of it just if it wasn't speech. I'll tell you something that I really object to, and if I were a baker, I would not bake a cake, custom, or even it has no real artistic elements, for a, a Jewish bris, a ceremony oh, where yeah. that, I find That's it good. barbaric. Yeah, um, and I, and it's not, I don't view if I made a cake, oh, now I'm expressing yeah. something, but participating in that has this uh, implication that I don't find it abhorrent. Yeah. Um, and I do, and I would not, and, but is that, does anti-discrimination prevent me from doing that? Um, so it's, it's easy when you think of these laws to find somebody, yeah. um, some b b guy who has the only motel in town, he won't rent to blacks and so on, to think, well, that's what we're doing. We're, but when you're hand government the power to do this, you're doing so much more yeah. than that, and it has really pernicious effects. Yeah, I mean, think about here's another one. Uh, if I were a clothing maker, you know, I would not want to make what are the headscarves, hijab. The, the hijab for. I just I, and especially so, a father with three daughters. I, I I I tell my kids, I just find I think that is just there's something so objectionable about that. It is so tied in with the idea that women are second class, that they have to hide their beauty, all of that. I object completely to it. Burke was the whole thing. And I would never want to uh, mm -hmm. do I, I would say, forget it. I am not sanctioning. I am not going to help this mm -hmm. process. That would definitely, I think, it would have to come within these laws. Because uh, that's a clearly, it's clearly connected to Islam as a, as a religion and certainly as a creed. Um, and one would put it as an ethnicity, as national origin. You'd be, you'd be violating, flagrantly violating these laws. And I think that's really, it's horrible to force people to deal with those that they find morally objectionable. And one thing we might want to talk about is what are the consequences of that? Because that really, I think, you know, you think that you're promoting or the idea is we're promoting social harmony here. And, we, and I really do think you have to separate out uh, the, the, the Jim Crow era and then going all the way back to the Civil War in thinking about how you deal with something like that and then thinking about modern anti-discrimination laws. Uh, for a lot of reasons, there's just a different circumstance but I think they're also motivated by different things today. Mm -hmm. than, than yes. It's not like in 1964, you know, everybody started with a pure, because I actually can, I'm sympathetic to people who voted for the 64 Civil Rights Act, mm -hmm. even though I think it was a mistake. If I were uh, in Congress then, I would have been hard pressed to vote for it because it's just the circumstances, and we, we can talk more about that. But it's different now, both in circumstances, but I think the motivations are, are, are very different. But one of the things we really have to examine as a culture, and when people talk a whole lot about what's going on in American society today, why is everybody fighting with each other? And it's easy just to blame Trump as the only reason for that, but that's, this goes way back before Trump. And we, we often talk about tribalism. When you pass laws like this, you give people a reason to resent each other on the basis of their, their uh, you know, their, their what group and what faction. The worst thing you can do for social harmony is to force people to associate with one another who don't want to associate with one another. Now you give people a reason to really resent each other and, and ultimately to fight with each other. And that, I think, is a really, really bad development. I think it, it fuels a lot of the kind of tribalism that we're seeing today. I want to get further into this issue of the consequences uh, and just explore that. Before we do, just a moment on part of what the case uh, hinges on, if I understand it, is this idea of, so the, the baker is in business. Mm -hmm. And his establishment, his shop, mm -hmm. is d defined as a public accommodation. Yeah. And there, therefore, he's subject mm -hmm. to these laws and so forth. Right. So say a bit about what is, it, what is that concept of yeah. public accommodation? What do you think of it? Yeah. So public accommodation is a concept that's been in the law for quite a long time. It really goes back to, uh, at the very least, uh, you know, English common law in like the, probably the 18th century, probably earlier than that. And ultimately what it, what it was, it was a way of designating a private business that was essentially open to the public. And there were certain laws and legal obligations that attached to that. In modern times, it's essentially a way to treat private businesses 
as though they are tantamount to public streets or government, a kind of a, you know, publicly owned buildings and that kind of thing. So one could say, certainly one should say, uh, the government cannot discriminate against people. That is unquestionably clear. It has to be a principle. You know, there should be a separation of, you know, morality and government and, and ideas and government. And that, that necessarily means that government can't be, uh, be discriminating against people for all sorts of reasons. But the same is not true of private individuals. Private individuals had to have to have the freedom to discriminate. And we have to draw a sharp distinction between public spaces mm -hmm. and private spaces, government action and private action. The public accommodations principle is a way essentially of blurring those lines and treating a business as though it's the same thing as the sidewalk outside the business that people have, you know, in effect the right to walk on and, and move through. Uh, and I mean, it, I think it's a flawed concept. I think it was always a flawed concept, um, but it was it, it had a much more limited use, you know, way back in the olden days when it first arose, than it does today. It's been a, it become a vehicle um, for uh, you know modern government to regulate businesses in all sorts of ways and really treat them as though for some reason they are not private property anymore. Now they still make a distinction between the private and the public, but it's. It's basically if, you know, your own private property, where you live, is not a public accommodation. You have the right to keep people off of that. But if you run a business, the moment you invite any members of the public into your business, in essence, the idea is it's free and it's open to all members of the public, and now you're regulated as though you're a public entity. Uh, it's a bad idea, a bad concept, but that is the, that's the kind of hook by which we, we end up treating a business as though it's, it's like a public park or something like that. And I mean, here at the, the Ayn Rand Institute, we often talk about uh, the ways in which there's prejudice and discrimination against businessmen. Mm -hmm. And this is a primary yeah. instance in the law that what the meaning of it is, is you as a businessman are second class and you don't enjoy the full rights that other people yeah. enjoy. And you can see that in the oral arguments um, in this case, because it comes up, well, if it's a religious institution mm. that's not really about providing yeah. services for everybody, it's not a business, it's not making a profit, yeah. it can do all kinds of discriminatory things. Um, but what that really means is it can exercise much more freedom, it has more rights to decide who they're going to deal with, in what kind of ways, who they're not going to, and say, we don't participate in these kinds of ceremonies. They can do that. But once you become a business, and here it's the commercial aspect. It's you're providing a service for a fee. You're trying to make a profit. You no longer have the ability to do those kinds of things. You don't have those rights. Uh, so, And it's, in terms of the First Amendment, is you don't really have the right, full freedom to speak. You don't have full freedom to exercise your ideas, including religious ideas, and you don't have the freedom to associate with whom you want and with whom you don't want. So I, I take it you're referring to the example that was brought up in the oral arguments where here's a Catholic charity that's helping people with legal stuff, and the moment they make a profit, well, that would change everything, even though uh, they're doing essentially the same work. Yeah, and it, basically what they were saying is, yeah, it has rights until it becomes a business and it is for profit and then all kinds of things are out the window mm -hmm. for it. And that's your second class citizen. And, and observe what ha one of the real ironies, tragic ironies of this approach is, and we really saw this I think in the Hobby Lobby case, is when you carve out exceptions for religious uh, entities like that, or really, I mean, you could fill in the blank, it could mm -hmm. be anybody. Right, right. You end up, and this is an interesting tension between free exercise clause and the establishment clause, is that if you look at the free exercise clause as we're carving exemptions out of laws for, for, for religion, uh, you end up falling right into, it's out of the frying pan and into mm -hmm. the fire, right mm -hmm. into the establishment. And that's yeah. what Hobby Lobby, in a sense, established a religious exemption to an otherwise generally applicable law. How is that not establishing religion? Right. That is state sanctioning religion as somehow more equal or more important as a moral uh, idea or moral practice um, or just intellectual practice than others. Right. And that's unavoidable with any of these categories. So the more categories, <clears throat> the more exceptions you have like this, 
the more you essentially have government favoring mm -hmm. certain practices, which necessarily means certain kinds of views. Um, right. And uh, there's just, no way to, 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 to fix that contradiction. Yeah, I was just going to say, just if, if tell me if this is an accurate summary of the Hobby Lobby case. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> so this was Hobby Lobby. They have these stores where you buy craft stuff, mm -hmm. um, like Michael's. And they wanted an exception to the Obamacare ruling where you have to provide coverage for contraceptive. Yeah. Uh, for, so, mm -hmm. And they said, well, that violates our religious yeah. beliefs. And, and so that's what you're saying, that in giving them this carve out, that is leading to the perspective. Yeah, of yeah absolutely. Mm -hmm. So Ankar, I want to circle back to something that Steve raised, which is this idea of the, there's a kind of tribalism where laws like these are pushing people into groups and then forcing them into into associating with each other when they don't want to necessarily, but whether they should be free not to, whatever their views and reasons for it. So say a bit more about what are some of the dynamics that lead to that and what does that look like as, as if you know, sort of the consequences of that? Um, so, so what, what, you mean the wider phenomenon of tribalism or? In, in the sense that, so this kind of case is now going to be, well, we Christians are oppressed, and then the, the gay community or the gay lobby, however you put it, now we're going to bash heads over wedding cakes. And now what's the next battlefront? And so there's a way in which these things, who's the next group that's going to form, and what is going to be the new battleground? And it becomes super divisive over things where there have to be better ways to deal with each other. Yeah, I mean, part of what freedom is about is about going your separate ways when you disagree. Mm -hmm. And that's the more you have laws like this that you cannot go your separate way. What you encourage is, I mean, this is what Ayn Rand called the kind of uh, society or government, uh, it's government slash culture we live in is a mixed economy, but she called it a pressure group yeah. warfare. Mm -hmm. And that you're encouraging people. He was, um, instead of the gay couple going to another business and and they could publicize this business would not sell us and so and people could boycott and he would suffer consequences it we're going to force you to do this so then you get all kind you get or you encourage the christians to go to government to try to get all kinds of laws to to that favor them versus other people and it you 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 encourage and in in certain ways, you're forcing people to do this. If they take seriously their viewpoint or their ideas, and if I don't have the freedom to enact it, to exercise it, um, I have to go to the government and try to find special favors. And it, there's no alternative than to recognize that people should be free. They should be free to go and have to go their own ways when they disagree. And that includes people whose views and ex the expression of the views and what they enact, you will really disagree with. And you, will, and you might be right that what they're doing. Like I do think that this idea that well, the Bible prohibits homosexuality. The idea of basing your life on, on texts that you have no idea, there's no arguments in them, you have no idea if they're true or false. That is not a way to live. I don't think it's a proper way to live. But freedom means people can do that, even when you strongly disagree and you're right to strongly disagree. But it's not like you don't have any alternative. The alternative is to talk about why you think religion is really bad, why the, the kind of discrimination they engage in. And I mean, previously they engaged in a lot of racial discrimination. You can point to why religion leads to this kind of irrational discrimination. You can argue for that. And you can economically boycott these things. So you have, it's not like, oh my God, you have no alternative other than to just say, we have to live with it. They're free, but you, you can argue against it. But you can't, the moment you start reaching for the gun and the force of government, you encourage everybody to do that. And notice one of the, <clears throat> excuse me, um, so we hear constant complaints today about cronyism, about special interests, about money in politics, about you know, factionalization mm -hmm. and all of the kind of, I mean, this is what politics is all about today. This is an example of why it happens. I mean, it's government essentially, I mean, it's bad government, it's bad ideas about government. It's the wrong kind of government. Forcing people into a position where they have to ask themselves, if I want to live the way I want to live, I have to go to the legislature mm -hmm. and I have to form a special interest. I have to form a faction. I have to lobby these people. I have to involve myself in politics. I have to give money to uh, 
to politicians. I have to go, you know, hobnob with these guys in Washington, D.C. or in the state capitals and try to get special favors for my group because the, the principle we've erected essentially is it's essentially screw or be screwed. You either screw other people and, and load, you know, uh, restrictions on them or you're going to be the one, you know, left out in the cold without any kind of uh, protections or special privileges or you're not going to be a protected class. And I'll just say, so we, we talked a bit about sort of our intellectual moral evaluation of the baker. I have to say, I'm not very sympathetic. Now, I don't know the gay couple involved, but I've seen them interviewed. and so I'm not very sympathetic to them either. And the idea that they're going to use the law mm, to yeah. force someone to bake a yeah. cake for a wedding when he clearly doesn't yeah. want to do it and they have many other alternatives yeah. and they're going to take this into the um, up to the Supreme Court. So I, I don't have the greatest view of that. And I've been, I've been in cases where businesses have discriminated against me mm -hmm. um, and I find it abhorrent. I will not go there again. I will tell people about it. But the idea that I would go to the yeah. government to try to make them serve me or something like that. Right. Now again, excluding the case of race when there was massive right. government discrimination yeah. against <clears throat> it. Um, the idea of doing that, I do not look favorably yeah. upon. Um, <clears throat> and I think one of the reasons that uh, you know gay rights, I think, has taken hold in the culture is that by and large, in my, my sense of it, is that's not the, this was really an effort to persuade people to think yeah. differently about mm -hmm. this. And I really, I mean, we talked about the fact that it seems like this changed overnight. Like all of a sudden, there were people were respecting gays' rights. And I, yes, it's not widespread throughout the culture yet. But by and large, among the young especially, it's just, it is an assumption. It is an assumption that this is perfectly appropriate behavior. It's a perfectly appropriate lifestyle. That happened because they persuaded people. Mm -hmm. Yes, it was a hard fight. No question about it. Yes, there were a lot of bad things that, that happened, but that's the right way to do it. It's not, you know, uh, uh, you, you can't expect the world to just fall in line between, you know, before or behind any mm -hmm. attitude in it. You've got to persuade people. And, and um, that, you know, that it will be lasting. And, and I think it, it, they, they've had much more success because they've engaged in persuasion. I think it's a real mistake to now go around trying to force people. I think it's going to backfire, or at least it's not a good good thing. So I want to take an even broader perspective and integrate a different aspect of this, which I think is uh, still connected. So um, in this case, he's the baker is complaining, well, you're, you're making me take actions that violate my beliefs, in effect, regardless of whether he's actually writing on the cake or because the, 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 the justice were very concerned about is it actually words and, and so forth. But your, your point earlier was that sort of the, this whole range of things you would do and their implications are you're endorsing something you don't want to endorse. Uh, most people in this country went to public school. And that seems like, well, it's a government-run institution. And it's, it's essentially content. And it, it's unavoidably bringing out intellectual issues. There's, I mean, obviously, mm -hmm. there's math and science. But, but even those fields, like we, we know those battles over evolution. So bring the, that perspective in here. And so what's your view of that? Is it the same kind of issue that, well, you're being compelled to support speech you don't agree with? Yeah, it's... It, um one should have the same view, and I think if you, a proper understanding of the First Amendment, also one should have the same view, but if just, if we're talking sort of philosophically about the issue of rights, one should have the same view of government establishment of religion mm -hmm. and government establishment of education. Mm -hmm. And there's no, they are exactly the same. Um, the public schools are government establishment of education. And government establishment of religion, of a church, did not always mean every other sect or church is barred from operating. Mm -hmm. But it's one is established mm -hmm. that gets public money and therefore dominates the society. And it's the same with public schools. There are private um, um, secondary and primary schools. But the government dominates. And what that means, it has to mean the government sets the agenda. Mm -hmm. Who can teach, what they can teach, what education will look like, that it's going to be three months off, mm -hmm. um, because uh, that's crucial. And there's so little innovation in regard to this. But the much deeper issue is, 
if you take seriously the, your own ideas and own view of morality, one of the most um, crucial things is how are your kids going to be educated? If you have kids, how are kids going to be educated? In what, in what kinds of ways? And to cede that to the government that I'm not going to decide those kinds of things. So, is such, it's an abdication of the citizenry, and, but looked at from the other perspective. It is, um, there's no way government should have that power if you take seriously the First Amendment and, and the wider issues, uh, Steve has been saying, of intellectual freedom. It is the major violation of intellectual freedom in the U.S. today. It seems like the, the kind of conflicts you get are similar to this case that we've been talking about. So I remember years back there were cases of um, parents complaining that the school library has books about gay, gay parenting, gay, gay marriage, gay families, or, or even or I mentioned earlier the evolution lawsuit mm -hmm. that went up about 12 years ago, 15 years ago. And but that's exactly the same kind of case where I believe the evolution is, is a valid scientific theory. I want my kids to, to be taught it. Another parent in the neighborhood says, well, no, that's, mm -hmm. that's just a theory. I want it equal time. Or President Bush's view was we need mm -hmm. equal time for creationism. Yeah, and, it, and if, so if you take that kind of case, it's similar to the baker, I mean, in, in the Masterpiece mm -hmm. Cake Shop case, because it's, you, it's easy to think, well, what's the big deal of banning the creationist? Now, I mean, a lot of religious people in America don't think that. But if you're scientifically minded, you know evolution has been proven beyond a shadow of a doubt. So what's the big deal? But if you take seriously the principle involved, it's government is making all these kinds of decisions. Mm -hmm. So what about whole language versus phonics <laughs> in reading? Well, the government's going to decide what the problem and, and it's not... I mean, there was a point in time where it's, oh, it's obviously whole language. I think that view is crazy, but people don't put it in the category of, well, it's creationism. But it's the same kind of issue. If the government has this power, it's making all those decisions. Mm -hmm. um, and don't just fixate on, well, but there's some crazy religion is, what's the big deal if, if they are not allowed to get their view into the schools? That's not the way to think about it. Yeah, think of the fact that, you know, it's hard to think of a major ideological, social, philosophical debate in America that hasn't manifested in the public schools. Mm -hmm. I mean, really. Mm -hmm. Religion, uh, uh, evolution, you know, uh, homosexuality, but I mean, you have things like just how books portray sex, which was a big deal, mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. banning certain mm -hmm. books. You have the issues of race and just whether it's, you know, I mean, Huck Finn and Tom Sawyer being banned from, uh, among many others. Environmentalism today is is a big issue. Just how businesses are treated and thought about today, income inequality, I mean, and it makes sense as a parent. There's so many things to object to to what is taught to your your kids in uh, in public school, and I mean that's just true. Uh, that's true across the board. Whether your ideas are good, bad, or otherwise, you have every right to uh, to to oversee the education of your kids. And if we're forced to to deal with everybody else and and to submit to a state uh, mandated education clashes are absolutely inevitable. Right. So I want to just bring us to a conclusion and, and circle back on, mm -hmm. on the case and the other topics that we were talking mm -hmm. about. So I, I, one thing that struck me as kind of a uniting theme that um, I, I've been I find really interesting is this idea of an individual's sovereignty and that he has he or she has to make decisions in life, including especially the beliefs they hold and the people they engage with and, and want not to engage with. Mm -hmm. uh, there's a lot of people I know I, I really like and value and they're part of my, and they're people I would not want to be part of. And it seems like that there has to be, in a proper society, that has to be something that is protected and not, th and not what we have now, which is the government steps in in many cases and prevents you from acting on mm -hmm. your judgment. So I want to throw it back to you guys to sort of final thoughts on the case and the issues involved mm -hmm. in it. Um, so on, on the theme you're bringing up, it's, uh, there's too much of a distinction between speech mm. and other forms of action. Now, there is a crucial distinction to make in regard to these, but it's, the distinction is not, okay, well, the First Amendment forces us to not interfere with speech, but if it's any other f form of action, government can willy-nilly or has a kind of wide purview to regulate and to control and to prohibit. And that's not the right way to think about it. That 
part of the issue of being an individual. And the First Amendment is, if it's about intellectual freedom, it's about the intellectual freedom of each individual. And the individual is important, and he has to be able to act in a way that he thinks or believes is right or is proper. And even if he abuses that and is not really thinking about the issue, and I think a lot of religious dogma is like that, it still falls under the purview of intellectual freedom because a real freedom to think is a freedom to think or not to think. Um, and it has to, it has to include both. And th there's an artificial split going on, which is why they're really trying to force this case into, oh, I think it's at least part of why. The cake is expression, it's speech, even if he doesn't write words on it, it's such, in the oral arguments, it's, well, he may be not an artist, but he's an artisan, and it has some real element, because the way the First Amendment law is, that speech is in a category of its own, and the moment it's, well, I don't want to associate with this, yeah. then that's action, that's not speech, and government has all kinds of control of it. And if you don't really question that distinction, um, and, and I think it, as a society, if we don't question that distinction, then you're going to just see more and more of this kind of case happen. Yeah, and uh, to pick up on, on the point that you made about cramming this into free speech, when I first heard about this case, I have to say I thought, this is BS. It's not really speech. Now, I'm much more sympathetic uh -huh. to his argument uh -huh. now, having read all the briefs and really understanding what he's doing. Uh, but if I had to pick what is the real right here, it's association. It's yeah. not really speech. And, and it's the development of the law, as you, you put it, you know, drawing this distinction between, uh, you know, you can think of it as, as civil rights versus economic rights or political mm -hmm. rights versus economic rights, ideas versus action. I mean, as you said, there are distinctions there, but from the standpoint of how government should protect our rights, it has to take all of those into consideration. And that has forced people into some ridiculous arguments that, I mean, we talked the other day about, there's a whole line of cases, I mean, I don't think any of these cases got to the Supreme Court, where sex toys are all considered speech. You know what, that's nonsense, they're not speech. Yes, should you be able to sell these things? Of course you should, but it's not speech. And 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 there's a way in which we we denigrate and 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 cause people to take free speech arguments less seriously than they otherwise would when we start saying everything is speech. Everything is not speech. Doesn't mean we shouldn't protect it, but it's it really, uh, you know, at a certain point, you, you overload the First Amendment or the free speech clause, and at some point it's going to topple and we're not going to take it seriously anymore. It's, it's what Ayn Rand talked about as inflating a right beyond its proper boundaries. Um, so that's a real concern, and, and one of the reasons that uh, this case was not argued as an association case is they could not have win won that, I don't think, because you can't, I mean, the way the court has interpreted the right of association, it's they've tried to draw a distinction between an expressive association. Mm -hmm. So the classic case was the uh, the case that involved uh, uh, St. Patrick's Day parade in Boston and a lesbian group wanted to be involved and they they said this is a private parade and it's expressive, therefore, you know, you can, you can prevent the, the lesbian group from being involved. But this is supposedly, you know, that, that if, it's, if it's, on the other hand, an all-men's club mm -hmm. was not allowed to ex, ex, uh, uh, exclude women on the grounds that, well, there's no speech involved here. This is just, you know, this is just you stupid guys wanting to get together and, and leave aside whether that's good, bad, or otherwise. It's, it's really just not a proper distinction for people to, to be drawing. It's up to, it should be up to them with who, you know, to decide mm -hmm. with whom they associate. And... Uh, and it's really doing a disservice to our view of intellectual freedom in general, and I think free speech in particular. It's, and I'm really concerned if you think about and listen to the oral arguments, and you just see the direction that we're heading with anti-discrimination law. Regardless of how this case comes out, I'm very concerned about the future of what these laws push uh, um, people into thinking as a proper way to think about intellectual freedom, and it's, it's not good. Right. Okay. Well, Ankar, uh, Steve, thanks for joining me today. Thanks. I'm going to conclude by uh, plugging the book Defending Free Speech, oh, yeah. which Steve edited. For those of you who are interested in uh, the Institute's perspective on uh, freedom of speech and intellectual freedom in general, I commend the book to you. Thanks. Thanks. Guys. Thanks.